This masterful passage of Scripture, it, it, it's so powerful in its truths. It's so disarming in its poetic beauty. The way that it leads to such a crescendo to say nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. That if God is for you, who could be against you? That we feel like sheeps led to the slaughter, but in fact we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. Believe it or not, it's all just a response. This is all just a response to a truth that we heard last Sunday. What was that simple truth? Do you remember? Let's even look back, all eyes on the Bible. Let's remember what we studied last week, and we're going to remember just how faithful and good our good God is. Verse 28 of Romans 8 says and proclaims, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. All things. Not all things are good, but God works together for our good. And then down in verse 30, this amazing truth. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified that we worship a God who has sent his son. And his son is not a halfway savior. His son does not only save us part of the way, 50% of the way, and then it's up to us to do the rest. Know that God has a perfect 100% retention rate that he who chose you before you even drew your first breath, he who saved you, who called you, and will lead you safely and forever home, he doesn't lose a single one. So here, we would, we would be content we would be overjoyed if the truth, if the goodness had just been encapsulated in those couple verses. But it goes, once again, even deeper. And the good news is even better. Because why? Because we tend to doubt over and over and over again, church, Christians, brothers, sisters, just how big our Jesus is. We tend to look at ourselves and look at our performance and then judge God's judgment based not on what he has done in the cross, finally, sufficiently, and forever for us. We tend to look at ourselves and say, there's no way, there's no way, God. There's no way after saying the things that I've said this week, after doing the things that I've done this week, after believing, or let's, let's be honest, feeling the bitterness or the anger that I felt this week, this can't be true. How is it possible that nothing can separate me from your love? So the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he knows our doubting hearts need to be overwhelmed with God's grace and his love so that we would believe anew again. So this morning, what we're doing is, yes, we're studying God's word, but this, this church is a belief factory. This passage is going to be like fuel for the engine of your soul to help you believe, to help you move, to help you Continue heavenward. This is the response to that amazing truth. So the Apostle Paul, like a good teacher, asks questions. Question for the church in first century Rome, but also the question that, yes, even the church here in Colts Neck in 2017, we need to remember, we need to revisit, and then we need to believe. Let's look at God's word, shall we? What then shall we say to these things, verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? That verse alone. That verse alone. I mean, I, I feel like we just need to 
allow that truth to saturate our minds before we move on too hastily and too quickly to other comments or other exposition. God, the supreme power in all the universe. Listen, there's two categories in all the cosmos. There's creator and there's created, and we tend to doubt the creator's power because of how messed up the creation has become because of our sin. Listen, we have the creator and the sustainer, the one who has not only created everything, but he holds everything together, and not only that, the one who sent his son to victoriously conquer sin, Satan, and death, that God, if you are in Christ, is for you. <laughs> Not against you. If you are still in your sin, if you haven't believed and trusted upon Jesus for salvation, if we are fooling everyone and pretending, and we're trusting in our own morality, trusting in our own tradition, trusting in our own religious ethnicity, whatever it may be. Paul's going to get into that next week. He's lamenting in Romans chapter 9 about how his ethnic Jewish friends who have denied the Messiah are cut off. So there are people that are separate from the love of Christ. Oh my. And that's why you're going to hear that word elect again. So the elect are those who have been adopted into God's family, his sons and his daughters. But this electing, choosing, adopting, loving father, he's for you, right? I mean, everything else, and I'm not trying to minimize or belittle whatever suffering or hardship you're going through right now. It's smaller. Not only smaller, it is minuscule. We, in the midst of this broken, hurting world that we live in, we feel like every single one of these trials is a Goliath that stands nine feet tall above us, accusing us, taunting us, clearly about to destroy us. And what we need to do is to remember to pick up those three stones, right? The, uh, the smooth stones, our slingshot, and say, Goliath, you're nine feet tall. You know who's bigger? God. He's bigger. Even if Goliath was the size of the Empire State Building, David's taking that dude down. Why? He understood what the Romans, what Romans is now proclaiming. That if God is for us, who could be against us? Now, some of us, we are excited to study the book of Romans right now here on Sunday, August 20th. There's a lot of people excited about what's about to happen tomorrow. Does anybody know what's happening tomorrow? Monday, August 21st, doesn't happen very often. It is not a partial eclipse. It's not a uh, annular eclipse. It's a what? Total eclipse. Have you seen all the newscasts and everyone talking about this on social media? And there's people that are trying to sell these flimsy little 3D glasses and they're trying to pedal them off as actual total eclipse glasses, right? Everybody's talking about glasses. What we want to remember is that when a to total eclipse, and this is special, I mean, there's partial and there's Totals hardly ever happen. They happen once in a long time. But a total eclipse blacks out the sun's light. Here's what's true. Even the moon can black out and darken the most powerful force in this solar system. But there is nothing in your life. There is no trial there is no temptation, there is no suffering, there is no enemy that can block out not the sun that gives us heat, but the son of God that gives us life and light. There's nothing. So even as you see the sun getting blacked out by this tiny little moon, remember, there's nothing, nothing that can step in the way of what God has done for you 
and his saving work in and through you. If God is for you, church, I mean, just think on that all day today. Who, what could possibly be against you? The answer, no one and no thing. If God is for us, who can be against us? All eyes in the Bible, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? My goodness. I mean, I, I could preach a sermon on every one of these verses. Um, if God is for us, who can be against us? You know what? That sounds amazing. That will preach, if God is for us, who can be against us? What you just heard is even more powerful. I don't say that lightly. In fact, without that truth that we just heard, the first one would not be the case. Without God not sparing his son for us, then we wouldn't have union and forgiveness and reconciliation with the Father. Do you remember, or can you think, try and think of all the different Bible stories throughout your Bible. What's the loudest no in all Scripture? The loudest no. Believe it or not, the loudest no wasn't said audibly. It wasn't said so that people could hear it. But Jesus knew what it meant. The loudest no I would submit to you was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus knows he's not surprised by the conspiracy of the Jews, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. He's not surprised by the conspiracy of Herod and Pilate. He knows. In fact, it's the reason for Christmas, for his life, for his ministry. It all leads to the cross. And here he is just hours away, hours from his trial, hours from his crucifixion. And he is about to sense not only we tend to focus on the physical. Not only the physical pain of being nailed to a wooden cross, not only the physical pain of the crown of thorns being pressed into his skull, not only the physical pain of being whipped and scourged, no. I believe he cries out to the Father because he knows for the first time ever, ever in all eternity, Father and Son will be separated. Jesus will become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, he comes in the garden, 100% God, 100% human. God, God, if it's possible, take this cup from me. It's the cup of God's wrath. That's what he's talking about. Jesus is about to take God's wrath upon himself for us. Now listen. Before he says the next line, Jesus knows the Father's heart. He knows the Father's answer. But we need to be reminded when Jesus said, is there another way? It's as if God said, there is no other way. This is the only way. This is the only path to salvation. This is the only way that we, as a sinful, depraved people, can be saved is to have the perfect Savior die for us. Jesus says in this moment of, of weakness, he says, Father, if it possible, take this cup from me. And it's not. Listen, I'm going to try not to get choked up here. God handed over his perfect righteous, holy, loving, majestic son to a cross, to a cross. Why? Why? Love. For you, for each of you. Oh, if that doesn't move you, if that doesn't wake us up from our apathy, if that doesn't quicken our pulse for Jesus, then we might not be saved. Then we might not understand the gospel. If God is for you, who can be against you? Praise God. What is the nature of this God who's for you? He gave up Jesus so that you could live. He gave up Jesus so that you could know that his love conquers all who 
does that? Who does that? Our Father does. And the Son was obedient to say, Not my will, but yours be done. Hallelujah. Verse 33, Romans 8. We will get through this, I promise. (laughs) Who shall bring any charge against, there's that word, God's elect, right? His chosen. We'll get into that more in detail next week. It is God who justifies, verse 34. Who is to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, more than that, more than that, was raised, who is at the right hand, who is indeed interceding for us in those short several verses, you heard the gospel. In those short several verses, we see Christ Jesus who died, substitution. In those short verses, who was raised, resurrection. Who is at the right hand of God, ascension. And now who intercedes for us, intercession. We have a God who has given us everything that we could possibly need for holiness, for salvation, for sanctification, for joy in this life. So the question is, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? I'm in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Let's look at those words, shall we? And maybe we can translate some of these words into our American context today. Shall tribulation, we're familiar with this, hardship, trials, we face them on a daily basis, distress. We are filled with stress because our world is in disarray. Yes, the world as a whole, but let's be honest, we often struggle internally, externally, from stress because our world is in disarray, persecution, famine. The book of Amos talks about not necessarily a famine of food, but a famine of the Word of God. The Bible is the most replicated, best-selling book of all time. We have Bibles in our churches, Bibles on our phones, Bibles on our iPads. There is a famine for the Word of God happening right now. It's at our fingertips, never more accessible and often easily denied. If you're a pastor, one of the most shocking things you'll ever notice is how in the lost and found, in every single church, there's a huge stack of Bibles and no smartphones. Right? Right? Huge stack of Bibles, no smartphones. I'll let you read into those implications on your own. Nakedness. Nakedness physically shame spiritually, danger or sword. Now listen, verse 36 says, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's connecting Old Testament with new. He's quoting Psalm 44, 22, and he's saying, now we understand that our subjective experience, it often feels like, and listen, these Christians were like sheep led to the slaughter. We struggle when we face just a little bit of persecution, when we have to be a little bit different than the culture around us. Early first century Christians, when they proclaimed Christ, they realized, all right, that might be a death sentence. To say, I love Jesus, I live for Jesus, Jesus is my king, would also simultaneously say, all right, to the Jews, Jesus is the promised Messiah, and they would want to stone you. Or if you say Jesus is king to the Gentiles, to the Romans, they would say, no, Caesar is king, and they would want to lead you into some kind of awful place where you would be hurt, prisoned, tortured, or even killed, right? So what we see here is that Old Testament or New, if you are struggling, if you are suffering, if you're being persecuted For your faith, you are not doing something wrong. Do we get that? Do we understand that? That if we are suffering and we're experiencing trials, doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. Old Testament and New, Psalm 44 and now Romans 8, that we are being led as sheep to the slaughter. But here, here's what's amazing, ready? No matter what trials we face in this life, John chapter 10 builds upon Romans 8, and Jesus describes himself as a good shepherd. We're sheep 
He's the good shepherd. And listen to this truth. All ears open, all minds ready. Jesus says, John 10, verse 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one, no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. How did that go over with his pharisaical religious Jewish audience? Not good. They wanted to kill him. So Jesus is saying, no matter what may happen in this life, no one can separate you from the good shepherd, from our king, from our father, who has given you to Jesus, and nothing and no one at any time, anywhere can ever separate you from his hand. That's good news. 9 a.m. service, you got to give me a, like 1 a.m. amen this morning, all right? This is amazing truth. So this builds upon it in verse 37. says, no, in all these things, we are what? Not sheep to be slaughtered. We are more than conquerors, right? We're not just sheep to be slaughtered. We're more than conquerors. In the original Greek, that, actually word, that word means hyper conquerors, like superheroes, like super conquerors. Like when you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you say, all right, who is that old person? I want you to see Superman <laughs> or Supergirl. Not because you have some kind of mythical superpowers, but no, because of what Christ, our Savior, has done in you, for you, forever, more than conquerors. So those things that tend to conquer us those things that tend to discourage us and it seems like defeat us. Listen, when we pray and ask God for help, we're not praying for victory. We're praying from victory. The victory has already been won. The battle is already accomplished. The war is over. Jesus, our conquering, victorious king, loves us knows us and has guaranteed that nothing could separate us. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, are we sure? I am sure, the Bible says, that neither death nor life, neither death nor life. Listen, have you ever thought about this? If death can't separate us from Jesus, I mean death, like you're dead, like no pulse, no air in your lungs, right? The mind's not flickering anymore. You're, you're gone. We ever think about this? If that can't separate me from Jesus, where there's no coming back from that, there's no bouncing back from that, you're not getting up from that, that's the end. Death is the end. Where is it? If death could not separate us, then what could possibly life throw at us? What could life throw at me if death can't, can't keep me from Jesus? I mean, that would be enough. But it goes on even further to say, neither death nor life nor what? Angels nor demons. There are demonic powers that we cannot see, that we cannot uh, perceive, that are trying to destroy you. The Bible says the enemy is like a lion circling his prey, looking for who he might devour. Now, if we are in Christ, God is for you. Not even the enemy can be against you. Listen, if we are in Christ, you're more than a conqueror. So even when demons, even when the enemy, even when the accuser wants to discourage you or defeat you, listen, real quick. Every single time he's reminding you of your past, you remind him of his future. He's defeated. But think of it this way. Every single time this liar, this accuser, this deceiver tries to accuse you, guess what he's doing? Wasting his breath. 
He is wasting his breath in an exercise of utter futility because none, no demon, not even an angel, shall separate you from the love of Christ. All his accusations are just hot air. Hallelujah. Nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers. A lot of us, man, we're getting stressed out about political powers. We need to back up, take a breath. Remember, Jesus is king. Everything's going to be all right, y'all. Okay? Last verse, 39. Nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus, our Lord. Nothing. No thing, no one, at any time, at any place, can separate you from the love of Christ. So, what is this an invitation to do? Is this an invitation to sin further? Lord, have mercy. I hope not. Is this an invitation to just go back to our idols that promise security, promise Safety, promise, satisfaction, but cannot deliver it? Lord, have mercy. I hope not. You see what's so good about the good news? Guilt is necessary only when it's rooted in God's word. We tend to use guilt in religious circles, not when it's based on God's word, but to try to motivate people to do something. The best motivator for holiness for happiness, for God's glory and joy in your life is to know that nothing can separate you. Nothing. No thing, nowhere, at any time, at any place. Why? Because Jesus has conquered our sin. He's conquered our enemy. He's even conquered death itself. So, now, this moment, what's the response? The Apostle Paul begins by saying, how do we respond to this? It's the question I ask you as well. Here, this morning, August 20th, how do you respond to this? Do we need to trust that Jesus is bigger than our stress? Do we need to trust that Jesus is bigger than our hardship? Do we need to trust that Jesus is bigger than the loss of a loved one? Do we need to trust that Jesus is bigger even than my sin? Absolutely. But don't allow this to give you license to run from him. Properly understood, this leads all of us to fall on our knees and say, hallelujah. God, you get all the glory. And in the end, you get my heart. Let's pray.